Well, thank you. I'm delighted. This is my first time in Nebraska. Yay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not here long, but at least there's no snow. <laughs> uh, and you have less humidity than Charleston, South Carolina, so, so that's lovely. Um, but first, let me say that um, in addition to being delighted to be here, this morning was incredible. I have been to a number of these kinds of conferences and, and work group sessions, but this has been very impressive. Sherry, Mary, um, your uh, national, uh, your action coalition is far ahead of um, the ones in many, many other states. So you have great things to be proud of, and um, I think you're on the cutting edge of some very exciting work. So I will um, be talking to you a little bit <clears throat> about strengthening the, I would call it the behavioral health nursing workforce, um, but we're using psych mental health here today. Um, and you will hear some things. I will pick up on some issues that were addressed this morning and throw out some ideas. You might not agree with all of them, but I think at this point in time, we need to challenge the way we're thinking in order to really move forward. So, all right, so what I'm not going to do is tell you about all the problems, about the lack of access, about the unmet rural needs, et cetera, because the fact is we have a stack of papers that really support all of these problems. <laughs> the papers would be taller than the Washington Monument, so we are not going to spend more time beating our chests and talking about the problems. However, we do have to acknowledge that um, life in the field sometimes feels like this for us as nurses working in behavioral health. It's a slippery slope. We sometimes feel like we're all by ourselves, and it's a tough road to climb. So I want to tell you a little bit about the Annapolis Coalition, and um, they have a website, the AnnapolisCoalition.org. Um, and basically, this group formed um, just about a decade ago. And the focus of this group was an interprofessional group of um, and we have a real crisis in our healthcare system related to our behavioral health workforce. And so um, we were federally funded to put together an action plan for behavioral health workforce development. This is available for a download also on the website if you're interested in it. It's a thick document. Um, but you can certainly download the um, tables or the summary sections of it. The plan was developed in 2007. It took two years to complete the plan, and we had over 5,000 participants from all different um, professional and consumer groups working with us. It focused not only on mental health and addictions, but we purposely focused on treatment as well as prevention. And bottom line, we identified a core set of strategic goals and objectives, and you can see those laid out, but by each one of those, we had an action plan. What needs to be done, and even more important, who's the stakeholder that should be responsible? Is this an issue for the educational side of the street? Is this an issue for the government? Is this an issue for the professional associations? And so we identified these as levers of change. You know, a lot of these reports, they just sit on the shelf. Nothing ever happens to them. So we wanted to actually make this into more of an action plan um, and, and make it a call to action in the field. So what did we learn from this process? We learned that there was a potential for us staying in process forever. And I think we know that as nurses. And there were a 1,000 points of no. So you know the thousand points of life, we have a thousand points, this, we can't do it for this reason, we can't do that for that reason, et cetera, et cetera. We also realized that all of the solutions that we were proposing were flawed. If they were very narrow solutions, they may be more effective, but they didn't scale up. So the overall impact was minimal. If we suggested broad solutions, um, they had a greater impact but it was definitely more uncertain that they would be able to be achieved. Bottom line, though, what we said was we need to pair workforce development and organi organizational change strategies. So this is not something that any individual can really take on, own, and make a difference. 
And so we needed to move to that level of, of understanding. So when we step back and what we want, what we're really talking about today is envisioning the future of healthcare. That's what we're, we're all dedicated to. And when you talk to clinicians, they talk about patient-focused care, creating healing environments, and of course, cost containment always is part of the equation. So what we have though currently is basically a healthcare system that has two doors. You go through one door if you have a general medical illness and you go through another door if you have a behavioral health problem. What we're wanting is to create a system in healthcare where there is one door that allows us to provide holistic care. And therein lies the challenge. So what we're hearing a lot about, and we talked about it this morning, is the concept of integrated care. That is now what we see as the future in terms of solutions. Interestingly, however, integrated care is defined very differently by different groups of people. So just so that we're all on the same page, the definition I think of is that it is care rendered by a practice of primary care and behavioral health providers working together with patients and families using systematic and cost-effective approaches to provide patient-centered care. So that definition manages to get in every buzzword that you'll ever want to hear in healthcare, and that is an art. So you can, you can take that and run with it with the money. However, if you look at integrated care, there are lots of different models of integrated care out there. First of all, who's the team? That varies considerably from one integrated care model to another. Spatial arrangements, where are these integrated care models located? Um, are they part of a hospital system? Are they freestanding? Are they part of an FQHC? This is really interesting. You would think that we would at least have some standardized protocols when we talk about integrated care, but in fact, if you've seen one, you've seen one. Everyone in an integrated care setting has their own protocol or pathway for detection, treatment, and follow-up. A lot of wasted energy there. You've heard of collaborative care, and some people use the word collaborative care instead of integrated care. Um, there's been some more research done on collaborative care. And then we have primary care behavioral health, that's taking primary care and moving it into a behavioral health setting, or we have behavioral health primary care. Do you see how many different models we have? So this is taking behavioral health and doing that within a primary care setting. So these are just some of the many models that are out there. And finally, we have co-located, and this is parallel play, that we simply have behavioral health here and we have general medical care there. And uh, th that's what I call parallel play. This is a very helpful slide because it really does show you the continuum of behavioral health integration <laughs> as it currently exists in the country. So um, over on the left side, you see we just talk about coordinating our care. Now that would be a big first step since we're very, um, we do minimal coordination and that is one of the biggest issues with our behavioral health um, uh, patients and families. And so they talk about screening, having perhaps patient navigators. We've talked this morning about care and case managers. Then as we move along, um, we move into issues of co-located care. And so now you're, you're starting to at least geographically come together. But truly integrated care is a system level integration. And I would suggest to you that we do not have that as a model existing in this country at this time. But we do have successful integrated care programs, and these are um, ones that you may be familiar with. In Colorado, there's a program called ACT, or Advancing Care Together. Um, Intermountain Healthcare has some very impressive integrated care programs. You've all read about collaborative um, depression care created by Wayne Caton um, in uh, Washington State, and that has a lot of research supporting it. 
There's also good evidence for stepped care. The VA is actually one of the leaders in developing and um, piloting various types of integrated care models, and they have some outstanding ones. And you've heard, I'm sure, of IMPACT, which is an integrated care model focused on the elderly. Now, given the fact that these are successful integrated care programs, one of the questions I have is, why aren't they scaled up? Why do they continue to remain isolated programs? We talk about evidence-based practice. We talk about translating um, research into practice. We have good programs, but in a sense, they're going nowhere. So let's look at the research evidence, if you will. Here's what we know. Integrated care improves the process of care. It provides better clinical outcomes for common medical and behavioral health problems, so not complex, but common. They do tend to provide more preventive services, but overall they are under-researched and um, there is a lack of scaling up. So for all of the research that goes on in this country, very little of it is focused on what we think is the big transition in care. I talked about this two-way street here that you either have a primary care setting and you move behavioral health into it, or you have a behavioral health setting and you move primary care into it. So let's see what we know about that. If you move behavioral health into a primary care setting, the research suggests that, in fact, you do reduce some of the biopsychosocial barriers to care. Um, patients have greater lifestyle changes to improve their physical health. There is, in fact, more focus on mental health and addiction problems. And the needs of patients with chronic conditions are improved and addressed. Now, let's go the other way. So what does the research tell us if we move primary care into a behavioral health setting? Well, we do reduce some of the common medical barriers to care. There are more preventive services offered. But the most common medical focus is often on the metabolic syndrome. And of course, that's because of the side effect of the medications. And only some needs of patients with chronic conditions are addressed. So basically what that tells us, the research says moving primary care into behavioral health is less, has um, less impactful outcomes than moving uh, in the other direction. And overall, it's still not very impressive in terms of what we are achieving through this transformation of care. However, we are well on the road to, um, to integrated care models, and I want to point out that SAMHSA has um, a huge section of their website devoted to integrated care. It is a fabulous resource. If you want to know anything about models of integrated care, they have how you can assess whether or not your organization is ready for it, how would you evaluate it, how do you have to prepare clinicians. It's just a whole um, huge resource for moving into integrated care. More recently, um, the uh, SAMHSA contracted with the Annapolis Coalition to develop core competencies for integrated behavioral health and primary care. So what are the competencies of clinicians who work in integrated care? And we, um, we took on that contract with SAMHSA. They are actually published and they are also available on the SAMHSA website. But let me tell you a little story about how that developed. So we got together experts in the field, and I was one of the reviewers for the product since um, I'm the president of the Annapolis Coalition. And what the first draft that was presented to us said, okay, if you're a primary care provider, this is what you need to know about mental health. And if you're a mental health provider, this is what you need to know about physical health. And I said, we have, again, split the groups. We, we are not integrating care. So they said, huh, that's true. Okay, that's a problem. <laughs> Let's go back to the drawing board. So they went back, had more meetings, more discussions, and they came out with one set of competencies. And I said, okay, now I think we, we really are on the right track. And you open up the first one and it says, competency is to adequately screen all patients. 
For the primary care provider, this means you need to know this. And for the mental health provider, and I said, you've got to be kidding me. All you did was group them together, but you still differentiated. And so he said, oh, right, OK. So <laughs> we'll go back once more. And in fact, the final set of core competencies does not say what kind of provider you are. It says if you work in an integrated care setting, these are the competencies you should have. So we got that done. But now I want to share with you the categories of the competencies. Oh, we have nine competency areas, interpersonal communication, collaboration and teamwork, screening and assessment. You can read the rest of them. Now, isn't this just good health care? Isn't this what we teach all nurses? So we spend a lot of time reinventing the wheel. And these core competencies are great. I think they can be very useful. You can go into an integrated care setting and you can ask the clinicians if they are, in fact, meeting these core competencies. But there is nothing new under the sun. And particularly for us as nurses, this is good holistic care. So where are we in the big scheme of things? We have a strong history of having our, quote, healthcare system being based on the medical model of care, which is focused on diagnosis and treatment. And of course, it's a very powerful model of care, but it has really <laughs> held everything else in its grip. You may remember, however, that there is also a public health model of care. We used to have lots of master's programs for community health nursing. Remember those folks? And then why did they all go away? Because there were no jobs for those nurses when they graduated. Because the public health model kind of faded away as the medical model continued to dominate our healthcare system. Only now are you seeing renewed interest in public health, only because we always like to be better and brighter, we have a new name for it. So we now call it population health. Does that make us feel better that we've created something new and exciting? But the fact is, when we talk about the social determinants of health, when we talk about not providing care on a one-to-one -one basis, but really looking at the needs of population, like we talked about this morning for Nebraska, and you saw where your needs are, um, there is now a different lens that we're looking through that allows us to look at populations of um, individuals and their families. And so that's an important new focus. I would ask if we're teaching that to our um, future clinicians, whether they're nurses or physicians, um, and we have to question how are we handling that in our curriculum. So what I would like to do <clears throat> is spend the remainder of the time talking about four specific areas and call for action on each of those. And the areas that I'm going to focus on for us as behavioral health providers are the settings, the providers themselves, our where we practice or how we practice, rather, and finally, education. Each of these areas, I think, needs significant reform and or revolution. And if we take small baby steps, we're all going to be well beyond our careers by the time anything changes. So some of the ideas may be challenging, but let's see what we can do. And I think hopefully you'll have some pretty interesting discussions this afternoon when you break into smaller groups. So let's start with settings. Where do we as psych nurses practice? Well, we know and we heard the statistics, basically hospitals and then clinics or community health care centers, whatever you want to call them. And more and more of nurses are going to community-based settings versus hospitals. We see the number of nurses working in hospitals across the country is declining, which is the movement of many things that used to require hospitalization moving into community settings. The newest term that we're talking about these days is the medical home. Everybody knows about that. Um, personally, I don't like the word medical home. Uh, I, first of all, most people don't really, can't really afford a second home, at least most people I know. <laughs> and if they could afford it, they would not want a medical home. They would like a vacation home, perhaps, <laughs> a relaxation home. 
Plus, it's not about medicine, it's about health care. And so I like to use the word health homes when we talk about this. The other reality that we're going to thread throughout our remaining discussion are these emerging technologies. So now that everyone has their smartphone, you can have your diabetes regulated, you can have your blood pressure, you can have your pulse, you can have your lab results, you can do all kinds of things that you don't need the face-to-face, one-on-one interaction with. And so we have to think about as nurses, are we preparing our students to use these emerging technologies? Because that's where the future is definitely going to be. So let's think about the future. Where do we need to be in the future? Schools. Do you remember when there used to be a school nurse in every school? Huh, the good old days. Um, I remember when I first started working as a psych mental health nurse, I spent one day a week in a school, in a small community, talking to teachers, parents, children who are having problems, picking them up early, doing some behavioral interventions. Those days are gone. Basically, we have nurses floating among schools. Um, and again, you heard about the preparation, their lack of comfort with um, anything behavioral health related. But let's look beyond schools even. Oh, and then my other pet peeve is when we talk about settings, we have schools all around this country that from 3 o'clock till the rest of the evening are totally vacant. They are buildings that stand. They are in communities. Why don't we use our schools as healthcare settings? And if you had that, families could access them goodness knows, after work instead of being asked to do something and take time off from work. In addition, there's no stigma going to a school. So you can have behavioral health providers in a school and they could be talking about arithmetic for all that the services that are there. So I think that's a huge underutilized element of our um, physical structures. But then think about churches. Churches have the opportunity to do a lot of positive things, and I'll talk about that in just a little while. Community centers and telehealth. So telehealth is definitely the wave of the future. In addition, retail stores. So there you have your neighborhood medical clinic. More and more of those are staffed by nurse practitioners. Um, in fact, in South Carolina, the whole CVS system of medical clinics is, is run by one of our graduates who's a nurse practitioner. But they're talking about doing psychotherapy in these retail stores, having an office set aside to do that. Um, they're talking about even doing minor procedures in Walgreens and Walmart and CVS. So whether or not you think that's a good thing, it's happening. And so we're either on the train or we're off the train. Right now, nurse practitioners are on the train, so we have the ability to really shape how we'd like that to go. And then here's something we don't talk about, prisons. Where are our providers in terms of prisons? And I'm really, uh, I think this is an amazing slide because it shows that we clearly have more of our behavioral health population in jails and prisons than we have in state hospitals. And that is the sad reality. And they are not getting treatment in the jails and the prisons. And yet, and I will say this, we have found that for our nurse practitioner programs, prisons are very, very open to having our students. And so that may be a, a real opportunity. We talk about how hard it is to get clinical settings. But this is where our patients are winding up because of the current um, justice structure. Let's move on to providers. Who is our workforce? <laughs> well, we talked about how we're all getting ready to retire. At least they look happy. <laughs> You know, there's something to be said for that, but clearly this is an aging workforce and we are not replacing ourselves when we should be thinking about this. Um, we have to bring together and excite a new generation of nurses who see behavioral health as integral to what they do as nurses. 
So let's go to um, CMS. This is uh, something that SAMHSA has put out, and this is a breakdown of the behavioral health workforce. So here you can see um, psychiatrists comprise about 9%, psychologists 16%, Social workers, 29%, counselors, 37%. This is um, a CMS SAMHSA spread that's available online. The question I had, and so um, I think you heard that I am on the SAMHSA National Advisory Council for about two years now, and with my appointment, I'm the very first nurse ever appointed to SAMHSA's National Advisory Council. There has never been. I did when I saw this slide and I said, excuse me, where are the nurses? So there was a recent article in um, uh, Health Affairs, and this was written by uh, a psychiatrist, Mark Olfson, and it said, let's build the mental health workforce capacity to treat adults with serious mental illness. And what he says is, Psychiatrists are 9%, psychologists 16%, social workers 29 So basically, these three groups comprise about half of the um, behavioral health providers. So you have to say who's doing the other half of the work. He ends his article with some recommendations, and I know you all like to be on the cutting edge of things, so I'm sharing them with you. First of all, expand loan repayment programs for specialty providers, increase reimbursement, train social workers, and build team-based care for in primary care. Now, these are far from revolutionary recommendations. We've had these recommendations for decades, or ones that are very similar. And so as you can see in the field, we are not coming up with anything new. It's give us loan repayments, pay us more. If you think anybody's gonna pay more for anything, you're really whistling Dixie. <laughs> so my question is, where are the nurses in that um, pie chart that we just saw? There are about 17,000 advanced practice psychiatric nurses. This is the best data we have to the moment. And we have about 82,000 nurses working in mental health settings. You have 691 of those 82,000 here in Nebraska. So those are nurses who are not advanced practice nurses, but they are working in your state hospitals, they are working in some of the other behavioral health settings. They don't get counted by SAMHSA. Now you have to say, why is that? because SAMHSA counts those who get reimbursed directly for their services. Nurses here are likely to be employers, employees, I'm sorry. And so they don't bill directly necessarily or they bill under someone else's billing number or if they're the 82,000 nurses working as staff nurses, et cetera, they're not billing at all. So by only looking at who is billing for services, we are missing half of the workforce. And then, of course, what about this? There are 3.8 million nurses in this country. Where are they? And we have to talk about that. Because it is my belief that specialty health care providers, nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, or social workers, will never, ever meet the behavioral health care needs of this country. Never. No matter if we quadruple our numbers, which, by the way, is not happening. The needs are too enormous. When you saw, in terms of how many people presenting in primary care have behavioral health problems, it's enormous. So we have to begin to ask, who is the workforce? Here are some other things. Where are the peers and consumers? So we now have the peer movement in mental health, and there are peer providers, and there are some new certification programs for the peer um, community in, in that they can now be certified. But you know who's the largest caregivers for patients with behavioral health problems? Families. Families are the largest group of care providers. And how are we helping them to be better care providers? 
I challenge all of us to think long and hard about that. And then we heard about lay community workers, and that is another untapped group, by and large, in behavioral health. It sounds like you are starting to, to move into that arena here. But in general, in the general medical sector, there has been a lot of activity using lay community providers. Um, and really working in schools and churches and community centers to impact health care. I mentioned this last evening, but one of my faculty has a, had a grant um, from CDC, and it was to impact diabetic care. Um, South Carolina is a little bit like Nebraska. We're a relatively poor state. We're largely rural like you are. Um, and instead of having nurses or physicians go into the communities to improve diabetic care, she trained community workers, people who sit next to each other in church and says, I'm looking at your legs. They're not looking too good. What's going on with your diabetes? In fact, through her efforts, she was able to reduce amputations among African-American males by 50%. Stunning, and that's through the use of lay workers. So we have a great opportunity to impact mental health and behavioral health care if we reconceptualize who are the providers. Now I want to also step back. Sometimes we get very much caught up in our own, um, in the way in which we do things, and I think it's always helpful to step out of your comfort zone and look at what else is going on in the world. You know, we're not the only ones with behavioral health problems, what can we learn from other countries? So um, I did a, a look at the literature and there were some interesting models. In Nigeria, they used stepped care, remember that was one of the models I said was out there, for depression in primary care. These were using community workers, by the way, they were not nurses or other kinds of um, qualified clinicians. In Zimbabwe, they use lay workers to, to deliver problem-solving therapy. Now, in this country, if you said a lay worker could do problem-solving therapy, you would have all of the professional associations jumping up and down and saying, no, you can't do that. I love this one. This is in the UK. They have web-based screening. What does that mean? Before you get admitted to the hospital, general hospital, everyone, no matter what, whatever kind of issue you have, you're sent a, a web survey that you have to complete in terms of prepared for hospitalization. So think, we don't do that. And then what happens? Someone comes in for surgery and nobody's asked them about their substance use or caffeine, and they start to go into caffeine withdrawal, let alone smoking. But in the UK, and again, it's a socialized system, everyone gets a web-based screen before they enter a hospital. In Australia, they have a great program. It's called the Mental Health Nurse Incentive Program, where mental health nurses shockingly go out to people's homes. Remember those days where we used to actually go into people's homes? Very successful program. It's targeted on those who have the most complex needs. So the WHO has done a lot of work with this. This is one of their publications. It's also available online. But it's scaling up care for mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. And it is a really tight little compendium. It's a great educational resource because it has protocols for how you deal with depression and some of the common um, mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. A great resource. And so what can we learn from the low and middle income countries? We know that in those countries that are making more progress than we are, they move from task sharing to task shifting. What is that? That means the rational distribution of tasks among healthcare workforce teams. So they're talking about not only sharing what we do, but what can you do that I don't need to do to make the better use of our resources? Consider how that compares to what we do in this country. We have task retention, oh no, you can't do that, to actually task withholding, such as not allowing advanced practice nurses to practice to the full extent of their education and training. So we are exactly in the opposite model as these low resource um, countries, and we restrict the scope of practice of anyone else, as if we could meet the needs of everyone in this country. 
So I'll tell you a little bit about um, some work I did in Liberia. So if you're familiar with Liberia, they had uh, 10 years of civil war, horrible atrocities. Um, they had incredible damage to their, not only to the physical environment of their country, where almost everything was burned and their, all of their electrical and their plumbing was destroyed in the, in the course of the conflict, but they had um, children soldiers who were drugged and forced to enter the army. About um, two-thirds of all of the young girls and women were raped during this, the course of the Civil War. And as they stabilized with the new president, who won the Nobel Peace Prize last year, by the way, um, they contacted the Carter Center. If, you, if you're familiar with the Carter Center, it's um, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. Rosalind's very much interested in mental health. They do a lot of peacekeeping activities around the world. But Rosalind's very interested in mental health. And they said to the Carter Center, we have to, we have to do something in this country. Liberia had one psychiatrist for the entire country. So they said, well, we could send more of our people to medical school, great, so six years from now we should have some folks out in the field, or we can think differently. And again, they're not constrained the way we are in this country. And so they approached the Carter Center and they said, we need to train the largest number of clinicians possible. Who is the largest number of clinicians in every country in the world? What group? nurses, every single country. So they said, okay, we do have nurses. They're general nurses, but we do have nurses. And so <clears throat> the Carter Center approached me about working um, to develop a curriculum for a six-month program of study. Now you think about our graduate school, right? And how many years of that? You know, we really... So 440 classroom hours, 300 supervised hours. It had specific end of course competencies and had multiple evaluation strategies. I designed it like a crash course for a graduate level psych mental health nurse. Went to Liberia and the idea was that we were going to train the trainers. So by bringing this curriculum, by teaching it, then as the students graduated they would become the teachers and so it was to give capacity to the country not to have Americans coming and doing it for them. By 2015, we had trained 150 nurses who chose to call themselves mental health clinicians. They have a little thing on their, uh, their uniforms that say mental health clinicians. And you can see they're scattered throughout the country um, where they have the uh, flag of Liberia, they have a greater concentration. Um, and these nurses then went back to all of their rural sites and they worked in the clinics and they provided behavioral health care as a first line of intervention. I will also mention that after these 150 nurses were um, trained, uh, Ebola broke out. So just as the country was trying to get back on its feet, it had another epidemic. And who did the um, health department of Liberia rely on heavily? these 150 nurses, because you can imagine the fear, the grieving processes, all of the social support, families torn apart, children orphaned, and so these 150 nurses were the first line to help Liberia deal with that, and one of the nurses actually contracted Ebola and died from it. But um, the program was so successful that the Liberian government went back to the Carter Center and said, now we have to do something about our children and adolescents. So we are in the process of training another 100 nurses, not the same ones, we're building capacity in child and adolescent mental health. If you can do that in six months, what are we doing in this country? So let's talk about building a workforce for the future. Here's some policy implications. First of all, we need better data. You heard from everyone this morning, we actually don't know our numbers, we don't know where they are. Why is that? We have access to the best electronic formats in the world. We need to allow for full scope of practice for all licensed cl cl um, clinicians, and I commend Nebraska, we do not have that in South Carolina. We will be the caboose. The train has clearly left the station. <laughs> South Carolina will be the caboose. 
will be going down fighting to the end for how we even have, this is unbelievable, we have a 45 mile rule that a nurse practitioner has to be within 45 miles physically of a physician, of a live physician, not a physician on a phone. And so then the legislature says, well, why don't your nurse practitioners work in the rural parts of the states? And I'm like, are you the slow class? How is that possible that you don't get this? And in a, in a time when we have telecommunications up the wazoo, and they're like, well, we don't know if we want to do that. And I said, why not 43 miles? What's magical about 45 anyway, you know? We need to allow for reimbursement if that is the model that's going to be prevalent in this country. All providers need to be reimbursed so they can all get on the um, pie charts. And we need to utilize non-behavioral health providers. These include our general nurses, peers, and lay community nurses. We need to rethink who is the behavioral health workforce and tackle it directly. Oh, I'll go fast. <laughs> um, all right, I just want you to know that the National Academy of Science um, it has published a new report on um, health care and health care directions. And they have four, uh, this is hot off the press, they have four recommendations. Uh, none of these are particularly new, but I do want you to know that WHO is pu putting out a new report on the behavioral health workforce. So that should be out in a month or so. So practice, who is the focus of our care? So here we have the PEPLAU model, the 50 minute therapeutic session. Again, I don't know what made 50 minutes so magical, but that is no longer the way in which the real world works. This report came out from the Institute of Medicine, the Psychosocial Interventions for Mental and Substance Use Disorders, and it says we have to move beyond medications, and that has implications for our own educational programs. We have to um, identify what's the active ingredients of these psychosocial interventions. If it has 10 components, maybe only four of them are the actual active ingredients, and we can scale it down to be more effective. We have to focus on quality structure, process, and outcome measures, and we have to effectively train providers in these interventions. And so we have to look at the nurses we're educating to see where they fall in this. So what's the call to action in the practice settings? Here's what I propose. I propose that our specialty behavioral health workforce, that's advanced practice nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, spend half their time seeing patients and the other half of their time be devoted to these activities. Consulting, training our generalist providers, think general nurses, educating patients and family, the real workforce, supervising the generalist providers and assuring quality assurance activities. That would transform what we're doing and the care that we can provide. It would give us so many more resources. What else do we need? We need simple screening tools. You know, we screen for diabetes, we screen for all kinds of things. There, the PHQ could be a simple screening tool. It should be used in every healthcare setting, period and we should be educating our students. It should be in every curriculum of every student. We need to standardize them across settings. If I went out, I bet you I'd find 20 different screening tools in the 20 clinics around here. That's just crazy. We need to triage patients. Oh dear, this is my theory. You know, here in behavioral health, this is what we do. It's like going into a delicatessen. I have a problem, I pull a ticket. Oh, look it, I get a social worker. Oops, I got a psychiatrist. Hmm, I got a nurse. We don't triage anyone based upon severity or what they need. So we have to triage based upon severity and type of service needed. We have to then have standardized pathways for interventions and establish clear referral guidelines. So if we're going to train our general nurses to be behavioral health providers in the front line, they have to screen, they have to be able to do some brief interventions and they have to know when to refer. That's not rocket science. We also need to change our research and I won't go into this, except I will point out that this U19, so NIMH has a funding mechanism called the U19 and it's focused on how to scale up behavioral health care in low resourced countries. 
So it's Nigeria, it is all of India, wherever there are. I think we have a low resourced country when it comes to rural parts of many of our states. I think we should have these grants for our own country and not just for other countries. Okay, so then we have the last one and that's education. Um, and we are living in the nostalgia district. I really believe that, it's the good old days. You know, um, you've all heard about diffuse, um, uh, disruptive innovation, and you all know about that, Christensen's work. He said the two institutions that are most resistant to disruptive innovations, you're gonna be shocked, <laughs> healthcare and education. <laughs> are we really teaching us, our, our students, to collaborate and be team members. This is also the real world. Whoops, I think there was supposedly another slide there, but it didn't come through. This is a, a conference that was um, held by the Macy Foundation, Enhancing Health Professions Education Through Technology. And it was amazing. I was the co-chair of this um, in, invitational conference, and sitting around this um, room were 50 individuals, but delightfully, they weren't from healthcare necessarily or education. They were from Google. They were from all of the technology sites. And when they were telling us what they were doing, I thought we in education and healthcare were in the dark ages. It's, that monograph is available on the Macy website. It is amazing what we are not doing. Here's another issue. They asked the, um, someone did a poll recently and they said to, um, across the country, what are the two top concerns you have about your health care issues in this country? The first one was clean water. Gosh, we've really gone back in time. We can't even supply clean water. And the second one was opioid. 40% of the population has been directly affected by the opioid epidemic. And so the Surgeon General, you might have seen, um, asked to call for an end to the opioid crisis and asked schools that were teaching the future healthcare providers if they would sign on to the pledge to teach about this. And here you go. In Nebraska, two of your schools have signed on. Hello, get on that website. Sign on, make sure your students know it because it is one of the huge issues in this country. So, what are, the, what are the actions for education? This is what I think we need to teach all our nurses, all. I'm not talking our behavioral health nurses, our graduate prepared nurses. Every single registered nurse needs to know how to screen, triage, and refer. Behavioral health issues should be the sixth vital sign. We should treat mental health first aid like we treat CPR and BLS in our nursing programs. Make it required, competency required. Simple, it's all standardized, it's all out there. We need to get away from the long-term patient relationship. I still value the relationship, but we have to talk about motivational interviewing. Every single student should be taught in motivational interviewing. So if in your baccalaureate program you're not starting by teaching it, you're really, you're, you're out of sync with the world, because it applies for all of healthcare, not just behavioral health. We should be teaching crisis intervention and de-escalation. That's a huge issue when you think about emergency rooms and actually most healthcare settings. Suicide prevention we already heard about. And there are good brief interventions. So SBIRT, you know that's the substance brief intervention and screening treatment process. Um, we should be teaching that to all of our students, starting at the baccalaureate level. And CBT, you know, everybody says, oh no, cognitive behavioral therapy, we can't teach that, that's graduate level. It is not. They have programs on the computer for cognitive behavioral therapy. And if you think about what nurses do, we plan, we intervene, we do it. We just don't think about it that way, and we don't help patients structure the way in which they're responding to things. We have to take down our specialty and our disciplinary silos. Teach only evidence-based interventions. One of my favorite things is, um, you know, we talk a lot about teaching evidence-based interventions, but the fact is, if we could just get our clinicians to stop doing things we know does not work, we would be far ahead of the game. We are still doing lots of interventions that don't work. We need to focus on task shifting, utilizing technology for anywhere, anytime learning. 
Create virtual learning pods. Why is it every one of your schools here in Nebraska has a psych faculty member teaching the psych course? Come on, wouldn't it be better if you had three psych faculty who actually were prepared as psych faculty, which is another issue that we referred to this morning, um, and did the lectures that could be done online. We have all the technology to do it. And then in your home colleges, you do the clinical application with actual psych nurses again. We have to rethink education. It is simply not working the way we're doing it. And then there's too many things coming up that we can't cover in our curriculum. So we need special focus on PTSD and trauma-informed care. We can't cover everything anymore. Why can't we do small certificates? You know, if you're in a setting that you really need this, we'll give you a certificate. And we have to work with creditors and regulators to remove barriers to care. That is so important. Our NCLEX is an issue in terms of the lack of content related to behavioral health. Um, accreditors probably wouldn't allow us to have those three nurses teach because somehow the accrediting bodies would say, no, you need your own. So the accreditors frequently hold us back from doing more innovative things. So in summary, our revolutionary call is to defy the odds. <laughs> what we need are the right nurses with the right skills in the right place, doing the right thing. And that is within our capacity to do if we think about it differently. So you've probably seen this quote by Albert Einstein, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. That is our problem. That is exactly the loop we are caught in and we have to be the ones to break out of it. We have ideas. You're going to generate some more ideas this afternoon. I think this has been an amazingly engaged um, program, and so I think sky's the limit in terms of your opportunities and your capacity to make change. And that is South Carolina. <laughs> Todd?